Yeah, it's actually four, I think, that's a quorum, right? Yes, it is. Four of them. I can go then, right? No! <laughs> Wait. If you, if, if you have to, it's seven o'clock now. All right. Um, so we figured out who's here. We have a quorum. Review minutes. Any changes? Accept them as this. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Public comment on any matter not before the planning board this evening. Malcolm Campbell is our guest this evening. Guest speaker. Uh, and <laughs> do you have any public comment? <laughs> if not, we'll move on to our 715 agenda item. We're early. Who's in front? All right, one little correction. It's 142 North Hampshire Ridge. Oh, my apologies. The, uh, yeah, the seven looks like, like, like a two, right? Yeah. I wrote it. So I have to run off the card with my glasses. Yeah. So what this is about, I brought four copies, and I got the originals here. So the originals over here. Um, how much history do you want me to go on? We went over a lot of this. How much history do you want me to you want me to like do? You want the, the nickel tour or the dime tour? <laughs> executive summary. How about, how about yeah, executive summary? Start with the penny tour. Start with the penny tour. All right. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, 142 North Hampshire Ridge was built in '83 by George and Sue Carlo. and at the time, for whatever reason, I have the original plan here. We, we can take a look at it if you want. That's four copies. That means my big copies. The access to the house was put over the Meals property. And what they believed it was actually on was the an easement. So this is two down that way. Here, I'll bring the big one. Get the big one. All right. So, if you look, you see the cul-de-sac, which is top of the North Hampshire Ridge Road. And the Pros Drive actually crosses this lot four 40-foot right-of-way. Uh, Kevin uh, Burnett, Bennett, Ben, ben yeah, yeah. Uh, he wanted to do some research on this. I don't know why he's trying to see it. How did this happen? How did this take place? So, uh, but that's this was the this was as the house was originally built in the in, in the early eighties. What's this symbol mean? Is that shrubberies? Shrubberies. Yeah, I think that's yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, there's another lot that's that's next to this house that used to belong to uh, I guess I can't remember Doug and Michelle Beals' uh, mother. Uh, she had one of the original houses up at the top of the hill, which is 144 North Hampshire Ridge. So what were you saying? So that's lot three? Yes, I believe so. It's vacant. vacant. It still is vacant today. Okay, lot three over on the left side. Right. Okay. And that 40-foot right-of-way is the access off the cul-de-sac to lot three. Oh, my soul. Right. So when is lot three fully shown there? It can't be. No, it's, 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 I've got okay. another picture. We, we'll, okay. we'll get to that part. I'm sorry, that's the dime, <laughs> the dime tour. Well, I'm trying to give you some of the background, the backstory. Okay. So, um, now, the Carlisles sold the house to Tom Lucy, I forget his wife's name, and they built the house at the top of the hill. Oh, lot three's on both sides. Lot three fully surrounds the place? No, that's, I think that's 31 on the other side. Yes, and there's 30, a house there now. 31 yeah. on the big picture. May not, it's on the right-hand right side. It's 31. Left 31 is on the left-hand side, Correct. and 3 is on the right-hand side? Yes. Okay. 
there's a 24 below and but this so this goes way back because they're all full of houses now there's houses in all those lots um, so the Lucy's bought this house we bought it for them from them now when they bought the house they they wanted to do an addition but they were too close to lot three to make to put an addition on they put a we can cut to the next one okay then there's the as built version what? this is proposed three bedroom house but it was built that was built but this is the with the addition this was this is a more recent i think this is 2007 okay so there's one more here mm -hmm. There you go. Now on this new, okay. so yeah, so it's it's reversed with the way. It the, says oh, eight. Yeah, yeah, right. it's up to the seven. So, the whole house is a little bit different. So what? Yeah. So what happened here was because they wanted to put this little addition on the end, uh, turned it was a bedroom and a great room. They did it. Uh, they bought this lot three from the Meals, and they did an equal land exchange. Boundary adjustment. Boundary adjustment. Okay. Yeah, for those purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the cul-de-sac, the driveway, which uh, was it was moved a little bit, the access to the garage was changed. Eastern Green did the work, but it still crosses the right of way. So when we came along, we bought the house uh, five years ago, and we found that the access has actually an encroachment. It's an encroachment on Meals land. So they graciously granted us uh, exclusive use easement on that right of way. They still own the land. They didn't want to uh, give it to us or sell it to us because they were concerned that they would be down to like. 20 feet of frontage. Their driveway is actually on what used to be Carlisle's land. And they have easements for that. So th they don't use that 40 foot right of way for their access to that lot? lot? Uh, they, they never did. They never did? No. Okay. No, they never did. Okay, so Niels owned the, the right of way, but it goes with the deed for lot three. Yes, correct. And now lot three, these lot three and, and now I own both of those. Correct. Okay. Right. okay. So, so that's sort of the, the history of where things are. Now, one of the projects that I have going, uh, talking with Gary about this, is we want to change the driveway configuration here uh, to give us, so we don't have a shared driveway going into this back lot. We just want to move the, drop, the the access to 142 so that it actually comes around off the cul-de-sac and accesses the, the, it's all contained within the property bounds of 142. Now, we'll go to the next picture. <laughs> and this is the reason why I'm here. Well, actually, that's a really old, that's the really old. So there you want one of these. Uh -huh. Here, this one. This can go down. Okay. So now the, the main just this is a, a drawing that Gary put together. I forget the name of his. Uh, Eastern Green? Eastern Green. Yeah, well, it's Eastern Green, but Jordan. Oh, what's his name? Jordan Associates? Yeah. Uh, that's easy, the uh, landscape architect that, mm -hmm. that uh, you know what we can do? I'll turn this this way. It might make it view better with the house, the same orientation for the cul de sac. Mm -hmm. So, now on the, the little pictures, I drew the reason we're here is that the, the landscape architect said one of the problems we have with this layout, as, as it currently is built, is parking, especially in the wintertime. Can't park in the cul-de-sac, so we tend to get jammed up 
very, very easily, and there's always the snow removal issues. So we wanted to put in a, a second one-story garage. It's shown here on the picture drawn in is the box that's sort of to the south. Yeah, that's just an optional picture. But you know, now the, the, the <laughs> ground, yes, the ground slopes away a great deal there. So I mean, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars in Philly, it's amazing what you can do, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> like the guy down in uh, right. down in uh, sixteen there. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, just a phenomenal. Yeah, it's like there's now a hole somewhere equally big. <laughs> right. There's probably many holes. Many <laughs> holes. <laughs> many holes. <laughs> yes. That's like, in China, I think. Yeah. Now, so the reason I'm here is the landscape architect said, "Well, if the garage was at this turnaround section where you pull in the new drive, the the foundation would act as a as a uh, wall to hold the soil up where this new access comes into the back lot. You know, those would be right on the boundary. It would be right on the boundary. Is that the access to this? So, what's marking right here is a proposed new garage. This is the uh, yes, that's what the, the architect said. That this would be a good place for the garage because just in the flow of the driveway, as well as using the wall mm -hmm. to support the, the soil behind. It's closer to the house. That's closer to the house. I'm not going to build this thing out here. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So it's just going to be either it'll be parking or we'll put the structure, a structure there. So the question really that comes down to is it would be a, uh, a variance because the 25 feet. Uh, from this, this is the this dotted line with the, is the, that's the boundary to Meals Land. Mm -hmm. But the right of way is exclusive. The use of this land is exclusive to the lot. So that's what we heard to you're discuss. At, you're discussing as to whether you can have a garage right on the property line. Mm -hmm. Which abuts the right of way. Correct. And which is 40 feet. Water. Right. But this is your lot. Correct. This is your right of way. Yes. But not as land. But not as land. Right. So I have, I have, a, I have the exclusive use of it. Meaning I'm, right. I'm right. the right. only one that can go on. But no, that's sort of the nut of the... It's, a, it's one of these yeah. weird... Right. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal to me. I mean, it's not really a big deal to have this garage or not. Uh, Into the future, then, is it possible that this land... You said it's a vac vacant lot right now, that it might become a separate um, ownership, and that it would need to have the driveway going through that? Correct. At some point, at some point somebody... If it's not me, it's going to be somebody else. We'll probably put a house there. Okay, so um, if this area to the south of the red box garage yeah. is 40 feet across, um, this driveway is only on a, the lower portion of it, so you could probably get a 25-foot distance if you chose to um, do a boundary line adjustment there. Well, the, the 40 is feet is, is above. Uh, the... the the 40 feet is this right away right here. Right. That's the 40 feet. Yeah. So if, in other words, if, if this is 40 feet, mm -hmm. then this is uh, 25 feet maybe. Correct. What about the possibility of changing it so that you had a, uh, you had a boundary line adjustment giving you the 25 feet between the end of this garage and where the new lot line would be? Uh, I don't own that land. That's the Meals land. Right. So you do a boundary line adjustment so you do own the land, sufficient land so that you would have your setback. So you mean I buy it from them? If that were workable. Boundary line adjustment would be you, you 
Like what you did. Well, yes, now, right. The, the, the you can land exchange. Right. And, you, exchange and you mentioned earlier that there was concern, though, by the meals around the this is not uh, something uh, amount of footage they'd have on the cold side. Right, right, right now, now they have the six, to to 60 feet. If this were a narrow okay, right of way, so what do we do about we'll that lack of, right of 100 feet of way if feet this frontage. lot three gets to go? Mm. On a cul-de-sac, what's that what, supposed to be? What is it supposed to be? Then they have a 15-foot frontage. Um, the third Correct. Right. Third I've got that would be the end result. Unless you say you give an easement on to cross it. <laughs> So, okay, but I'm just trying to keep you know, up with it. What I think I hear you saying, though, is you don't mess with a cul-de-sac. You still leave that. And as we see on some of our pictures uh, of, of some of these things where the, where the footage on the road is 15 or 20 feet deep, mm -hmm. um, and then the adjustment is made interior to that. So I see it like you're kind of like just just go. So you don't the, change the call to sack. So they already don't right. Right. And you switch this over here yeah. and over mm -hmm. and make the boundary How line adjustment there. there. It doesn't affect the right away. And it gives you the mm -hmm. footage that you need in order to mm -hmm. uh, put your garage there and still not so right now, cause trouble. Right. He's got this. Yeah, so that's cool. <laughs> that, am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm saying that so you are wider there. Because they're going to use that anyway. And then it right. narrows down. Because it's a right of way, you have exclusive no, use so to it. So see the frontage, because he's got all over here. Well, you want to do that? It's this guy that wouldn't have it. Right. Um, that's, a good, that's a good idea. Because I know that, see, they've got 60 feet on the cul-de-sac. Yes. It's a completely bizarre thing because my my corner on the on the cul-de-sac is actually on the road, it's all the way down the road. Yeah, you've got no, you've got a lot of time. Yeah, from, like, from here to <coughs> here, switch the line like that, and it's done. And then just write a new easement for lot right. three to cross that piece. Yeah. The other thing. Yeah, that solves okay. that. Yeah, it's wider here, mm -hmm. and then it. Jogs over to allow for the 25 feet across here, and maybe you can play with the sighting of that. Exactly, it's not. Uh, and, can and, you put it here? Uh, I don't. I don't have a topo line, so I don't know whether that's. It, well, these or. these it, uh, it's pretty steep. This is a drop off. This is about to you know to bring it out here might be. You have the same problem as this. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's okay. the Glen thing. Yeah, I just. <laughs> Didn't know. We could truck that. I'm sure I thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> I even thought about buying my own uh, uh, dump truck. <laughs> to you just go around film. the neighborhoods and collecting uh, fill. Spare fill? Spare <laughs> fill? Craigslist. Clean fill all the time on Craigslist. <laughs> so that's, that's an approach to use with the. Uh, so I, I, I talked to, to Doug and Michelle and see if they want to do that. And if they don't, that's fine. And then we don't. You know, it's no big deal. Really. Can you explain so what the it. proposal would be? What Was this your solution you came up with, Dick? Um, <clears throat> because I didn't totally understand. Scott and I were they're, looking they're, at they're the cul-de-sac. They're going to reduce the width of the right-of-way. Okay. Right behind where the proposed garage is going to go so that there's 25 feet there. So that the boundary line would basically do a, a boundary line adjustment like this. Yeah. That would enable the so they keep setbacks that the are, are required that. Right. without changing the cul de sac village at all. Okay, so there would still be the same there. frontage on the cul de sac, right. Right. which isn't enough according to the standard, but it wouldn't be any different from what there is right from now. From what it is right now, right. Okay, that's a good idea. Because if they, if they gave you the whole thing, it'd be down to 20 feet, which would be. No, and if you need, wanted to do an equal exchange, you could figure out some other land. Yeah, this this lot goes you know goes down <coughs> here. You actually could just move this job. <coughs> so there wouldn't be any in terms of lot area. Same lot area, and you wouldn't there wouldn't be any need for an exchange of uh, money. You were buying land from him. 
between right. just doing an exchange. Just an, an equal land exchange. Yeah. Get out a hunk of string and... <laughs> I'm feeling better my father can attend. I'm glad I'll keep the doors around that. Yeah. Was that, would that fly? I believe it yeah. meets our... No, no, so, just um, so just it's doing an equal land exchange. So you can go from adjustment. not doing it to doing it. I guess so. If you... If, the, if they go off. If, if you go off, yeah. Yeah, essentially that lot three is a non-conforming lot according to today's standards because it doesn't have enough frontage. Um, anyway. So you're taking a non-conforming situation and not making it any worse, which is our requirement. Don't we make look, it worse. We look for that. Yeah. It's That's a good do more harm. Do no, do more, do no <laughs> more harm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, cool to sacks are always an issue, I guess. Yeah. But okay. technically, you have the same footage on the call sign. Mm -hmm. You two parties have come to an agreement across there, mm -hmm. and that allows you your 25 foot setback from the property. Yep. Line. And they can they still maintain their frontage. They have their frontage. Mm -hmm. You get your 25 feet, and they get something back here yep. that's that agreeable to. You rewrite the uh, right of way or add. Yep, uh, and on if, you know this is now this now becomes my land, mm -hmm. so I just create an easement for mm -hmm. lot three across that piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Similarly, if we take this chunk and give it to them, it's just basically because the house would be over here. You know, it's not going to be right there. Mm -hmm. So the drive, yeah. of course, is really long. So. Okay, that's a good plan. I should have thought of that before. <laughs> it's developing back lots are always, you know, difficult. Yeah. But uh, but we don't really have any particular plans to develop, develop. We might sell this house and build a smaller one here. This thing is, you know, large for our purposes. So. Great. Makes good sense. Works. All right. Well, I'll, I'll talk to Doug and Michelle, see what they say. And if they don't want to do it, then don't get the garage. Then I don't get the garage. You already have garage. Yeah. Small. <laughs> <laughs> Snowblower and bicycles and shovels and skis. Garage is not You know how I end up? I'll tell you how I end up with this. We also own the house at 77 in Hampshire Ridge. And the second day of the season, six years ago, ski season, over at Spillway, and uh, Buddy says, Watch out for that hole down there. It's big, really icy. It's a big hole down there. Ski right in with a crash, wreck my shoulder, knock myself out, oh slide to the bottom. And I had just, we were just planning to try to build a garage at 77. So I ripped up the carpets and stuff like that. So, so I'm out to dinner <laughs> a few weeks later, and we're, we're out to dinner at the, uh, at the door. My buddy says, well, that's pretty stupid. Why don't you just buy another house with a garage? <laughs> oh, that's a good plan. Then, so, <laughs> so I went online and this house was on the box So that's how we ended up with it. <laughs> pretty well. Not today. All for the dislocated shoulder. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Is that it? Uh, what? Yeah. Right. All right, so. I, I think so. It's now. Isn't it that you Yeah, so now, and then yeah. if they agree, what do I do? Then you get an application for a boundary line adjustment. For you guys. Yep. Yeah. Um, and to do that, you'll need to probably work with an engineer or a land surveyor who will... Yeah, we're going to set it all up. They know all the points and all that. And they're very familiar with us. They've done all this stuff. So, right. that makes sense. Good plan. It's a better place than we were when we talked, right? Well, kind of. Although I said to Gary, I said, well, go ahead and pull the permits for the driveway and stuff. We should probably just go ahead and do that anyway. Because that's not really related. Yeah. You know, that's just a driveway thing. So. Okay. All right, great. Well, thanks very much. Okay. There's a small fee. You'll get our bill. From okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I paid that already. Didn't I? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably so. Yeah. You want these? Oh yeah. You can yeah. Just restart these. You don't want this thing. Yeah. Yeah. File them in the official minutes. Uh, my, my pictures. Uh, no. I've got these. But, um, I'll, I'll keep these. Um, okay.
Sometimes I file them with the minutes if there's any question. It sometimes helps. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Thank you. We're doing very well on our timeline here. Um, and we will adjust the, the, the note to 142 instead of 147. Yes, thanks. Um, so this, this uh, next agenda item on start work on master plan and goals, this is not my idea. I can't take credit for it. <laughs> This was Betsy's idea, and I said, it's a great idea, um, but let's break it down um, if we can, because I think a lot of times when we're working on stuff like this, we usually take it in on too, too much of a time. Mm -hmm. um, and we usually do it in a manner that um, seems to be under some sort of deadline. Like, we got to get this done because we got such and such a report to do and, and there is somebody has asked us to jump through a hoop of some kind in order to meet some requirement that we have at the state. Um, and now that we've done a, a, a plan, it's a 10 year plan. Yeah, um, the trouble is it takes... Ten years goes really quick. Yeah, And it takes three years to develop the next plan, so you really have a seven-year plan that lasts for ten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have a ten-year plan that lasts for thirteen. 13. <laughs> okay, so on, on all those uh, kinds of thoughts, um, you like to forget about the stuff after you've gone through the process of putting it together and then leave it for another seven years and then start boiling it again. Um, whereas I think Bessie's idea of taking a look at it and seeing whether or not we set some goals and whether or not we can actually do something to have a, actually have objectives uh, that can move the goals along or whether or not there are things uh, that are available to do or not do. Um, and are there any possibilities or, or not? Or if there are possibilities, what are we going to do about them? Uh, so I think the, uh, Betsy, could you, could you help me understand better how you perceive this might work? Sure, well, um... I don't know what, I, I think in a way it might be smart to look at the master plan and see what goals people feel really ought to be worked on. I just chose, I, I sent you maybe two or three suggestions, um, and you suggested we just work with one, so I arbitrarily chose one that I know we've talked about. How do we, um, how do we try to use uh, some of the town lands um, for workforce housing or something like that? And so I just put that in. Um, but one of the approaches, we're not going to solve any of them tonight. Um, one of the approaches might be to go through the master plan and see what people feel is um, a, an objective, um, a way to meet a particular policy that is something we can attack and, and try to um, make recommendations on. You know, it's, it's pointless to have a master plan with these goals and objectives and so on and repeat them year after year that these are our goals and these are the objectives to reach our goals um, and to just republish them every time we redo a master plan is never going to get us there. Well, when we went through to do this plan there were quite a, you know, a significant number of objectives or goals that uh, we could cross off because they had been achieved. Yeah, exactly. So this wasn't yeah, a total loss. No, 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 absolutely not. Well, one thing that I was thinking of, um, it might be a little controversial to attack, but um, it's something that we it's been worked on, and that is the zoning, and sort of take what Tara Bamford was suggesting, is to mm -hmm. look again at, at the zoning. And I um, had reviewed the, I can't remember, it was in the, the last month or two, uh, reviewed the discussion that we had after the ad, um, the build out mm -hmm. where 
Tara came and we had a whole meeting at the, the Whitney yep. Center and she presented it and there was quite a discussion about the an hour so um, and a lot of good ideas came up and it was all pointing toward well we really need to step back and maybe just uh, mentally erase the lines that we have now uh, just take the town and say uh, what do do we have districts do we have and uh, I'm just kind of looking at it fresh just um, to see what we have and get some ideas maybe a, a group together um, and to look at it yeah. and, and throw out some ideas and maybe look at other other towns to see what they have um, and I think that would be a major undertaking mm -hmm. but I think if we do it properly or delicately and have the sufficient amount of uh, public hearings that, that we might be able to make some progress on that. Yeah. Yeah, she was sort of suggesting, as I remember it, four possible districts. Um, you could have a village district, you could have a rural commercial, um, you could have a rural residential, and uh, um, a loop or something or the, where the five-mile circuit could be sort of a um, slightly more intensive, not totally residential, not totally commercial, mm -hmm. but a blend, recognizing that we've got um, inns and hotels and so on that are on that loop. Um, so rather than have them continue to be non-conforming, write it in a way where we're allowing those to to be there and to thrive so that if um, you know the Whitney's Inn burns down, somebody would be able to uh, redesign it, rebuild it, and, and be within the zoning regulations. So it's something to think about, talk about. And also be a, where you could encourage um, home-based um, mm -hmm. occupations or small yeah. small um, enterprises that would be out of maybe a house that is partly residence and then partly business. Exactly. Or to have a house then that becomes a business, yeah. um, but have restrictions on it so that it fits in with the neighborhood. Did you say that you recently pulled up some of that material? Um, I actually it got the um, thanks to our friend the vanishes that we have the the tape of it, um, and I actually listened to the uh, the whole discussion yeah. from that. The, and was there any email material that went around from that after that? that? Yeah, just no. regarding that whole. Or was that, did, did that, Tara write that up in any fashion? Was it just no, a, it was, what she had done, <clears throat> she, the occasion was her presenting the build-out yep. material. And then that, um, in the discussion of the build-out material, these other things came up. And there wasn't any note, I don't know, was there any minutes taken from that? Um, but there is the recording so that mm -hmm. we can go back and um, I may have taken a few notes from it, but I think I was uh, reviewing it for a specific purpose, looking for something. And, and then as I listened to it, I, I realized that there was you know, some, some good ideas were coming there. So it, I only asked in case there was something that we could, you know, Look at yeah. and go over, right. especially those that you know. Right. More it would just be a matter of um, going online. And, and she didn't put it in that report that she. Gave well, no, us. the report had already been distributed, so this was after the report. So her mm -hmm. obligations were done. She was just. So um, is there a, a link to that then? Um, I can um, check check what the date was. I think I can figure it out. I don't know if I can do it now, but. Okay. It's also very similar to what the, P the PDI came through with, right? That they were recommending that we do something or other with, uh, they at one point suggested Thornhill Road, I think, or the um, 16D loop. Yeah, I, I had seen it in something like it in print. Yeah. Nancy, can you help me out? When you put this together, to develop a long range plan for the use of town owned property, um, that sounds different than what I think Sarah's talking about. Yeah. What, and, and if this is the idea that you kind of tossed out for the agenda for this evening, um, do we have a lot of quote-unquote town-owned property that is developable? Um, Back here is the biggest one. We have the old transfer station, which I don't think is 
fill the pool because I just found out they're still monitoring the wells. But then grew. there, there are some parcels that you, um, that the town takes for lack of payment of taxes. Right. If we can never sort out what happens at uh, the Dana Place condominium, what do they call those? Well, On the other side of the road. Well, townhouses? Where we have uh, deeded, tax deed for the remainder of development, but would not clear as physical land or just the rights of development and the owner up there is very difficult um, to deal with and there's always yanking our churn. You know, it, it, it's been a tough go. Yeah. And, uh, but we do have something up there. If you have $3.8 million, you're all set. You can buy it out. Right. And that's what we probably should do is get a bond and buy them out. But anyway, okay. there, there are a few parcels, not a whole lot. But. Yeah. Um, so, so often this parcel in particular has been talked about um, for what are we going to do with the 33 acres. And now it's, a lot of it has been developed, and then there's some steeper land there that may not ever be developed. And I think the town sentiment is to not um, put a, additional structures on it. But then there are some other parcels. Um, it may not be a, a thing to discuss, but I'd l I would love to see us go Sarah's direction and choose um, to re-examine um, current zoning and see what ways uh, we could more easily meet the needs, <clears throat> the, a way to have the properties that we value here no longer be non-conforming would be wonderful, I think. That may not be feasible to put it into good language without having, you know, a lot of hotels popping up all over the place. Well, yeah, we could do... I think if you work with the language enough and bounce it off enough people and uh, try to you know, devil's advocate, we might be able to come up with something that could fly. And then a difficulty we'd have would be trying to sell it to the town folk to vote because um, a lot of times people want to basically put a, a gate up at the covered bridge and say, we're here now, nobody else should come in. Um, so to get town's folk in favor of something like that and might be not difficult. Not come in or not change anything. Yeah. Or, you know, there, there's always that. We like the quaint little village. And we have to, as you say, pick away at it, pick our spots. Yeah. Um, one thing I would like to add would be to uh, go back to Burr Phillips and see what he says about his part of zoning uh, enforcement because he has to you know, read the subject plans and mm -hmm. if he has any suggestions that would make his life easier. And so, I mean, he's a good resource for us. And then as we talked before, I'd like to you know, do something with water extraction now, whether it be put it in a master plan or if we want to try to put some uh, wording together. I, th I don't think we're being impacted by it right now, but there's no sense in uh, wait <coughs> waiting for Nestle to come in and start drilling for us to have something in place. And it's, it seems to me that, at least from my limited perception, that we have an awful lot of barriers um, to development. And some of them are very natural. I mean, when you talk about Burrow Phillips, it's like the soil is just not right for a lot of development. And the fact that we're in all over a very large town area lies, good part of that is not owned by. Uh, individuals. It's, it's owned by either conservation arrangements and or uh, by the National Forest. So we don't really have anything uh, to do or say about any of those things. Um, and then we have among the potential you know, build-out plan, even there when you look at the soils and 
the limits. Um, and then you get to the where you know, a lot of the other barriers happen to be financial. Uh, the cost of the, a lot of land here is much higher than, say, in Conway or uh, Albany or some other town. Um, and those are real. Those mm -hmm. are real barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> you know, we want to. You can't make uh, changes to people's perception on what a piece of land is worth. Yeah. Um, we have talked about looking at some of our zoning regulations and, and whether there's anything we can do to to make development not as costly. Yes, we want to. If we want to support development, especially towards you know affordable housing, so we've talked about frontage, right. which we've just you know came up with. That seems to and, be, but it also has the same opportunity that I think somebody just said about potentially having more uh, more hotels or, or more housing units that are for resort purposes, as mm -hmm. opposed to housing. I mean, if you make it cheaper. To develop, uh, does somebody come in and say, yeah, okay, now I want to have multi-unit, um, small rental units for... Yeah, but the frontage doesn't really impact that so much. It's, you know, that's more than the lot size and whether they're doing a, you know, a cluster or something. I think where frontage really would have the most impact is the single unit situations, but it just that's one thing. And we see, you know, it, it it matters both in terms of a lot having the front of the needs, but then we also see a lot of um, <clears throat> roads put in to create frontage, mm -hmm. which is both an added cost, but in some ways might lead to the kind of development that we don't really want to see. Mm -hmm. Because once you put that road in, now you can probably develop the lot more so than you could if you just were relying on a frontage on an existing road. And because of the cost of putting that road in, you're probably going to maybe want to subdivide even further to offset the cost of the site work. So it just seems like frontage is, is something that comes up in almost every subdivision conversation we have. And so if there's one thing, that, you know, and we've talked a lot about doing things to promote uh, a, a greater supply of housing for, you know, it's in, and when we say affordable, I mean, there's, there's really, you know, there's workforce housing, and in Jackson, you know, in particular, the ability for people to work in Jackson, to live in Jackson, and where I think that really is, is most important is when you're talking about teachers and police officers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. such. Um, then there's also housing for young families to kind of promote the community and keep our school full and that sort of thing. And then uh, senior housing as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, To me, it's, it's cost prohibitive around here to do that, though. Mm -hmm. It truly is. Um, over when my daughter lives over in Bolton Landing, there was like a hotel, motel, like almost right on Main Street. And this guy who's buying it went before the planning board. It's going to be workforce housing, affordable housing for everybody. They did one unit. Mm -hmm. The rest of it went for five hundred and some thousand dollars for each unit, and they were all bought up by people that just wanted from the city coming up, and they wanted. Sure. And that's what happens. You can't say this is going to be for the whole thing. You can't limit yourself doing that. And that's what happened with that unit. They had one unit went for so-called affordable housing, mm -hmm. and we just don't. People aren't willing to give up a hunk of land that you know is going to be at least $200,000 around here, to put one unit up, it's not, it's not cost, cost-wise it doesn't, how can you put a one or two bedroom house up, or two bedroom house up and afford, some, and have somebody have, that wants to go in there that's a teacher, they're not going to afford that. It doesn't work. I mean, well, I'd like to have it be that yeah. way. Well, the idea is that by allowing more development, that's going to drive one end cost down, or... And, and where, where are you going to do that? Where are you going to where, where, it, where? It may just simply increase the number of uh, people that we have, as we have now. We have, what, 900 plus full time residents, and, mm -hmm. and how many of our homes are, are occupied by 
um, folks who, who are, are part-timers who own them as second homes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, There's definitely a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And I was in Glen for 12 years, and that's part of Bartlett, and I know that a good part of their housing is, is simply owned by folks who live in Massachusetts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, it, if you uh, if you have something on the market that's under two hundred thousand um, dollars, it goes very quickly because there are folks who are looking for housing who live in the area and need a home. I mean, they yeah. just need a place, but it better have three bedrooms, mm -hmm. um, and they want to have, as you say, for folks who are trying to raise a family. Um, and those houses move very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it, 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 especially if they have a view or if they're in a nice place or if they're, you know, you, you pick and choose what, what it is that's nice about things. A lot of the homes in Jackson are really nice homes and uh, views and nice neighborhoods, whatever. You pick what it is you like about this town and it immediately puts the price up. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of part of the reason we like that from a homeowner's perspective uh, because it means that we get a better bang for our buck if we go to sell but uh, it also has its limitations in terms of entry into the town mm -hmm. we had um, does anybody remember sort of the history on the the houses that are at Spruce Mountain that small development it's like four small and, and Peterson's and place and Peterson's place and that's the sort of thing that we're talking about because that fits into the um, the style and the um, the neighborhood. And yet, I think those houses are I don't know are they rentals or are they yes yes they're rentals yeah rentals. So it's that's the sort of thing that you would like to encourage. I think that'd be wonderful. Well, that hasn't stopped anybody from coming in and doing that. It's just that Anne was nice enough to give the property over to do that with. I mean, it's still Anne's property, no matter how you look at it. Okay, so she she owns, so she developed that mm -hmm. yeah. as rental property. Yeah. yeah. So. And we're part of our discussion was to um, allow people to own because you've been invested in mm -hmm. right. your home, but then the community. Right. You know, you're really a part. Your kids are in the school, not just. Mm -hmm. Well, like Jason, who has to move now because his house is being sold, he can't buy that house. He can't find another rent that you know mm -hmm. satisfies his family needs. He's, he's an excellent example. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and so he has to move out. Yeah, well, I move. No, no, he'd be he can't afford to buy that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyway, but it seems to me that our discussion headed towards zoning. I think that would be maybe our... A way to get there or, get there or potentially... Well, just, you know, we, we can talk about... Well, you know, we can chase these things around because I've seen yeah. it. You know, we were, but if we get focused in, I think our energies are best used. You give it a shot. So when you say zoning, do you mean different... Districting or different zoning regulations? Well, that's what we have. I think that's if we have the goals of trying to help housing, mm -hmm. I think we're going to do it through zoning regulation. So, uh, as the discussion goes, uh, maybe it's a different district um, for various parts of the town or different regulations that would allow something like Ann Peterson's a cluster, you know, where yeah. it's not technically uh, acceptable now, but we could make it acceptable. So I, I think that probably is a good, one of the good places to uh, take a look at it, at least focus. Because I think no matter what we do, as I said, when we start, it, we have some limitations. Even if you opened it wide open, mm -hmm. um, we have some natural limitations mm -hmm. that are going to prohibit. So, 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 I mean, you're still going to have soils. Some issues with soils. You're still going to have to, that are going to prohibit uh, certain development. Now, you, you got a big chunk of land there which you have a conservation easement on there, um, and you know, they, they ain't going away. 
Uh, yeah, but even if it did, it, but, even, but even if it did, you, it's in a floodplain and you couldn't no, build no, on it. So it's like, yeah. okay, let's change. We're not going to be able to say, yeah, go build on a floodplain. Yeah. Plane. So, so, if somebody, so if somebody has like a three-acre lot and they want to, okay, chop off half of it and sell it off, would that be, you know, would that be changing? Because I know when we first moved up here, everybody had to have a two-acre lot. Right. Now you can go to a soils map and say, if... Um, you can get a dwelling unit on a piece as long as the soils will uh, support accept all that kind of septic. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you need uh, 44, 45,000 square feet, that's an acre. Okay. Well, I mean, that would help. So, help you know, you may say, okay, well, we could get, you know, two dwelling units on this two acre lot that was here now could be two dwelling units. So that snapped up by somebody from Massachusetts who wants to check it exactly. out. Exactly. Um, the um, didn't we just do that with accessory apartments? You could either have a separate place or one attached? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And then and I I like the accessory apartments now. And uh, but again, that's not ownership. So I, I always want to keep that idea that um, we want to get people in here, particularly if we're going to talk about worker housing or young people, that can own it. Something, something they can afford to buy. You know, it doesn't have to be the ranch hat. They don't have to have eight acres, mm -hmm. but they can have their own house and a lot. And, and feel attached. We were discussing this the other day with a group that's working on workforce and, and affordable housing ideas. And Tish Hanlon was saying that home ownership is not the trend now. That a lot of people can't or feel they can't get into home ownership and are looking more for rental. And that's harder to make happen. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder to find somebody like Ann Peterson who's willing to put up rental units and have the hassle of collecting the rent regularly and so on. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think of something in the area. I mean, I can't think of any places that, you know... Lend themselves to it, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, apparently the 30 or 33 acres or so up at Dana Place or Wildcat Townhouses, I'm not sure which, I think it's Wildcat Townhouses, there mm -hmm. um, is some 33 acres or so with currently 10... Um, rental unit type places on it, nine of them occupied apparently, and one not. So that's one thing that the town is looking into, I think. Well, when you, have you, there, you don't have any, you, you own the condominium. I mean, you don't, you, don't own the, you don't own the land that it's built on. It depends. There are a couple of different types of ownership. You can have a townhouse um, type of ownership where you own the land that it's on, a small part, parcel. Um, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, different kinds of ownership. You know, pod, yeah, plan unit development. Yeah. Okay, and then the other thing is that up there it's all, there's a lot of water, a lot of rocks. You're talking about a $5 million project to be able to fix all that in order to be, and put septic systems in and everything else. And you're talking about a lot of money. There's no affordable about that at all. Well, there are units there that must be septic systems. Exactly. They're, these are existing units that may not be in great shape. Well, they're not in great shape according to Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, but maybe it means that if the infrastructure is acceptable, maybe they could be improved or rebuilt or something. Are they owned by separate people or is it one, one ownership for the whole? Um, That's what we're... Because it, it's at the Attorney General now because it was a uh, timeshare. Mm -hmm. And now it's going over to condominium. But we don't know if that's true, you know, whether that fellow has the rights to sell as a condominium. Oh, so which it's, had been timeshare, yeah. It had been timeshare, so the ownership is really uh, a bit squirrely up there. And we have affordable housing um, incentives in our zoning now, um, and this reduced frontage that, that's offered. But it's really much more designed towards cluster 
type yeah. development. Um, Which realistically but, would need to happen. But we, we just not, we're not seeing that type of development in, in any way at this right. point. And would there be a way to craft something like this that's more designed towards a single unit development where that property then you know, if it's going to be, if we're going to, if, if, if it's going to be created with less frontage than what we typically require, then for some period of time that property has to be, if it's sold or rented, it has to be sold or rented to families within an income bracket, kind of like we have here, to, to kind of promote mm -hmm. that sort of single residence type development as opposed to the cluster development. And then, and, and just say it's a uh, smaller lot or less of a road frontage or, you know, you can do a lot with the common septics. I mean, you, you could... Right. You, you, know, you can develop this lot with less frontage or smaller or whatever, yeah. so long as... Yeah, well, there, there are there's certainly so mechanisms that, that they can use. The town I used to live in Connecticut, we had... A, uh, the housing development was originally developed by a fellow who was a doctor and, uh, and who wanted to do exactly this. He wanted to put together housing that would be affordable. Um, and in order to, uh, to live in the homes that are there, you had to have a certain income level. Um, and you could, uh, you, if you exceeded the income level, you had to move. Wow. But can you really put those restrictions and, today? Yeah, and, 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 and not only that, you could you could sell your property, but you could only uh, be within a certain percentage of the appreciation value of the home yeah. during the period of time that you lived there, and and that's could only be sold for that amount of appreciation, like so that the price of the, is, the, the, the price of the uh, unit um, would be less expensive for someone. And who haven't had restrictions what the sales yeah, price could be. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you can put things into place that accomplish that. Yeah. Well, I didn't know legally was section ten. Right. Our our ordinance pretty much covers that kind of thing. Right. Um, the but, workforce housing part. Right. But again, it's one dwelling unit per four. So yeah. For every four, the constructed at least one should be affordable. So, what about the possibility of asking um, some local builders to come and talk to us? Um, would that be? I mean, I know you're a builder, but you may not have all the answers, Dick. Um, I don't. I never have. <laughs> um, do you think that um, asking, you know, two or three? Would you start with the builders, or would you start with the real estate? And aren't you jumping the until we find some Yeah, I, I think the builders are the What's the question? Can well, build, how, how can build we build small or inter, inexpensive? Or the question is, how could we word something or other in our ordinance that would be a sufficient incentive? I mean, this um, one that we have in our ordinance now was what put into place in two thousand nine or ten or something. I don't remember. Um, and if nobody's Ten. okay, so if nobody's come forward to use that part of the ordinance yet, we obviously don't have a good enough incentive, and maybe it's that we have too many boulders. Um, and that's a disincentive in itself. <laughs> and we also live far away from where the jobs are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but we haven't had anyone come in with. Any type of right. multi-unit development. So, right. you know, this only works if someone's already doing a multi-unit development. Yeah. Right. Then it's already designed to, to get somebody to do the multi-unit Four two right. and eight, whatever right. it is. Uh, so. But nobody's doing that right now. Right. Exactly I mean, would right. would having someone from Habitat come in? Because that would be interesting. To some of what they do to ensure that you know the the building is passed. Along to yeah. you know others that are like you know of that income, but it's more about the construction, isn't it? Um, I mean, we do have the regulations about how it got sold and how the person originally buys it and so on. I think, but isn't our problem finding somebody who will come in and actually do the construction and be able to make it affordable? No, because they, you still get builders that are building FHA 
houses. I mean, the FHA has 1,300 square feet, I think, and has, you know, they, they have a lot of regulations, and that'd be interesting to see if uh, we could get some of their parameters, because that's a small, efficient house. But, mm-hmm. but construction is construction. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether it's in Jackson. It doesn't have to have marble, you know. Well, I remember oh, when we built our house, Dick Twombly went out of business because of the boulders on our land. <laughs> True. I think it's, it's more the property value, you know, that drives the, yeah. the, the land value that drives the overall property value. And so if, if this piece of property, if you want to subdivide your land, but the, the piece that you can create has not enough frontage, but you can still do it and sell it at a lower price. Yeah. But that still may meet your own goals. But then that property then is now, you know, into that affordable housing. Um, but you have to be able to right. You can build out a property with right. a million right. dollar home on it, and that way get your money because it's you know half the. Cost of the of the property, or you build, you know, twenty units that total a million dollars, or fifteen units that total a million dollars on that same property, and have the zoning set up such that you achieve the same objective in terms of its value, right? and but you have many more housing units. Well, I guess what I'm thinking is more that piece of property is sold towards. A single unit being built on it, but yeah. it I, 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 to, be, to be honest, I really don't think that happens. Well, this is the way to make it happen. Yeah. Is that you're allowed to set, you're allowed to subdivide so that you can then sell a piece of property that doesn't have sufficient front. Yeah, but it's not the frontage; it's uh, it's the septic for crying out loud. No matter what you said, you you, you almost absolutely have to have. We have, and we don't have a two acre minimum, but boy. If you take a look at the arithmetic on that, it says that you have to have a minimum half acre. Um, well, and, and maybe we address that as well. But there are there's property that can't be subdivided because you can't create. You know, the, no, I, I hear, I hear the, the original saying. property I, I, has barely enough frontage, yeah. mm-hmm. and so it can't be subdivided. We just saw one today. Right. And so if we the back lot right, might be. So if we had a mechanism that allows you to subdivide mm-hmm. with less frontage, mm-hmm. but you then get less money for that piece of property when you sell it, mm-hmm. but it still may be worth it to you. Mm-hmm. But then that the the, the, re, the way that you can do that is that that property. <coughs> has to be sold to a family or, you know, within the income brackets you kind of outline here. And then that property has to continue to be sold. We're not restricting the value of the property, we're, we're restricting who can buy the property. And so that property, I know you can't do it in perpetuity, mm-hmm. but for some extended period of time, that property has to be sold to people within a certain income bracket. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'm going to be able to restrict that. I really do not. Well, so we do right here. here. I understand what you're saying, but I still don't believe it. There's enough lawyers out there that can make a case for uh-huh. being able to do it. Well, but enough lawyers is not. Can, it won't be worth doing the, the subdivision in the first place. If you have to, yeah, you know, if you have to pay to go to court to to make it happen. I mean, it's, it's done in other places. Yeah, so I know. Jerry, I think, Jerry, I think, husband Jerry has talked to Habitat for Humanity about. It, he said, the guy from Habitat told Jerry, and they, and they if you could same, find so. a piece of property yeah. where we could put five units up, yeah. um, and he said that, um, and he said that they would be able to kind of fix it so, sort of, people that were moving in there would... Um, there are definitely legal instruments There's, that you like, can put it, on it, so that the, the deed is restricted as to how they can sell Exactly, it. exactly. Yeah. And, um, but he said you have to find the piece of property that it could be on. Yeah. He said and mm-hmm. unless you have people that are willing to give up part of their property or buy a piece of property in order to be able to get these units on here, um, he said it could be if you could find a piece of property. Yeah. And that's what he told Jerry, because Jerry asked him about how mm-hmm. we could... Yeah, this is maybe about a year or two years ago when, when he was talking to him. Well, yeah. I, I know from my perspective, I'm speaking from ignorance and bias. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, 
to be honest. It's, it's like I, I, I'm ignorant of a lot of things and I have a lot of biases about a lot of other things about how things should work. And I think it'd be beneficial to take a look at all the different ideas and, you know, Scott, you see one way of maybe doing this and it, it makes sense to you and it may not make sense to me up front. It may make sense. And there may be an idea you have that, um, you know, you think should work and, and it can work. Or then we find out that there are limits that we're not seeing that, uh, that are going to create too many barriers for, for, for reality. Um, but I think a lot of what we bring to the table most often is, is how we feel about ideas, things. Exactly. And not necessarily what can be. Um, and so it, it would be useful to run through some of this stuff and try to figure out which of the things are, are real, which ones aren't real, mm -hmm. which ones are things what's that, sure you know, what, you know, what can yeah, you do and yeah. which ones don't you want to do? I mean, you know, there's some things that you may be able to do and you just don't want to do and you can say that and that's okay. Yeah, I, that was kind of my idea is to get as many ideas out and we don't, we're not going to um, shoot them down at the beginning but have them there. And, you shoot them down later if you want. Oh yeah, you shoot them down and want. I know when Larry was um, still on the board here before he passed away, he was looking into um, the prices of houses in town. Mm. And he said there are a good percentage of them that are anywhere from two fifty to three hundred thousand dollars, which yeah. is in today's day and world affordable housing. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a question of people want to hang on to their houses. I mean, it wasn't like they were you know out there selling their this houses. This houses just looking at all the houses and their evaluation. At, yes, yes, evaluation. Not well, not ones that were set for sale. No, 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 just no, no, no. Looking at ones that were the evaluation yeah. of no. what the properties were you know, well, in town. And there are a lot of properties in town that are owned. By families. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been owned by families since the 30s and the 40s, and they'll never be sold. I mean, I mean Chris, Chris McAleer is a, a family member of a, a, oh, of yeah. a property that it's was built in 1934. Yeah, right down the street. Corner of Tin Mountain. Yes. And Black Mountain. And they'll never sell it. Uh -huh. Or 18 owners or 16, whatever it is they mm -hmm. have now. That, that, and the little house um, that used to be owned by the sets, the little red house there across from, nobody's been in there for, I don't know, 30 years now. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect little house if somebody would fix it up and right. that, that that's be, a big, good, yeah. affordable housing. I did. Um, Mark Sagner, I lived there when he first came to teach. I mean, he was the principal of the school. And I think he yeah, was Yeah, and uh, Tim Kelly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He lived there for yeah. a while. And, uh, yeah. You know, but young people that you know, exactly. just needed a... Mm -hmm place to nestle in for a while. Yeah. Is there some way we can push that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think there there are things we can do if we set our minds to it and mm -hmm. if we just kinda say, well, you know, like I said at the beginning, there's a whole bunch of things that tell us we can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so then let's figure out what we can do. Maybe we should put an ad or something in the newspaper or put in the town town reports looking for some houses that somebody yeah. wants to sell. You know, affordable housing. It, I think sometimes if you make it your goal to do something, I don't to see what the next meeting. <laughs> I mean, I'm being facetious when I say that, Scott. We may have to push our select people to do something different. What's a full page ad in the sun? Right, well, I think we've got to come up with some words that uh, protect our idea. In other words, we, we're going to start, we're going to have to craft the language mm -hmm. that gets us to what we really want. Because you know, and however many smart lawyers are out there, um, somebody will come up with one that will break our chain of thought. And, mm -hmm. you know. There's always a reason not to do something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I see sort of two different tracks going here. One is that what the planning board can do, and mm -hmm. that would be as a town and through regulations and, and zoning and so on. But as far as affordable housing goes, I can see that there are individual efforts and discussions um, and finding out about properties, one that could be used for Habitat for Humanity, or um, I was talking to one of the builders in town once, and his suggestion was, was when we were talking about accessory apartments, 
He said that rather than trying to build something new, he said there's a lot of larger houses that only a couple of old pe older people are living in, and they yeah, I know, and it might be a good situation. Yeah, yeah, right. No, but um, houses that are could be then divided up into two or three rental units, right? And maintain, and that way, you know, it's much cheaper than trying to build a new mm -hmm. three apartment building, and it would maintain the character <coughs> of the town. Uh, but that's not something I think that the, the planning board as a board can do, but it is something that individuals can, uh, or mm -hmm. small groups yeah. and can, actually, can if, work for. If we can find words that help promote that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And say that it, it's our, it, not only is it a goal and a planning document that gets filed every 10 years, mm -hmm. but it actually is part of the dialogue and, and process of what we do on a day to day basis that changes everything. Yeah, we really haven't turned anybody down yet. I mean, it's once. I mean, we have a lot of people waiting at the door, at the gate there to. Well, Rick Davis came to us and changed the house to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. multiple units mm -hmm. for rental. Um, we haven't it, turned anybody yeah. down yet. Yeah. The, the, the one issue with that, especially like mother, you know, the, the accessory apartment, you know, was sort of something that we did do that was in part intended to increase the housing supply. It's just. Today, more and more of that type of rental unit um, is going to Airbnb, mm -hmm. you know, which sort of yeah. exacerbates the problem. Yeah. In some cases, being able to, you know, if you, you know, buying a house that has an accessory apartment that you can then rent out through Airbnb may be a way for someone to buy the house in the first place. So it's not yeah. always a bad thing, but mm -hmm. a lot of the, 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 the income that you can get out of Airbnp is, I've heard of several times, greater than what you can doing year round and less hassle because. Right, because you know, it's a short. Yes, it's short, right. And, short, and, if you, and if you take a look at Airbnb, which I had a real opportunity to look at because our house got listed on it uh, inappropriately, mm -hmm. um, it was you know, pet friendly, $585 a night sleeps 12 and um, we didn't list it someone listed it was trying to make some money on it and fraud um, and, and so I got a good opportunity to take a look at Airbnb and what, I've saw, what I see is that we have right now about 60 properties in Jackson that are listed on Airbnb and, really? what, ha yeah. wow. and what happens is, is that some of our higher price properties um, because they can't be sold they've been listed and not turning quickly uh, have gone on Airbnb and people have done now had them on for two, three, four, five years now, um, and occasionally they get relisted, um, but they're they're renting them out and they're renting them out and it's being able to maintain the property mm. at least to pay taxes and all the other good things. I'm not sure how, if it's making a profit. I don't know how it. true it is. The number I heard is that you can get three to five times. Mm -hmm. the income through Airbnb that you yeah. can buy renting. Yeah, you can sell if they can mm -hmm. get, if they get rent. Yeah. yeah. No, well, yeah. this is based, it's not, it's it's what you're likely to get in right. this area. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's three to, you know, if you, if you have an apartment to rent mm -hmm. and you can choose to go find someone near around or do Airbnb, you're likely to get three to five times the yeah. It's not that you're going to have it rented every night through Airbnb right. Right. because of what you get per night. No, if you could do that, I think I'd give up my house. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, <laughs> Five eighty-five a night is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so how do we take it from here? What do we do with our next step? I mean, we can't just continue sitting around the table one night a month and talk about why... It's a problem for us. So, what, what can we break it down into steps? If, if we're going to be looking at zoning, if we think that's a real opportunity, can we break it down into steps? And if so, what steps can we do? Well, I'm going to look into the uh, Walcott townhouses a little more aggressively. With terror? Because that is 
a piece of property. Where, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, or the oh, town Kara, has been deeded. Kara to come and yeah. talk? But I don't know what a good idea. that means. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll look into that. That would be my first. Scott was asking about getting Kara Bamford back down to talk to us about some of the options that we might have. I don't know if she's seen anything that's worked, you know, in other communities in terms of sort of turning the tide. Well, it might be worthwhile for one of us to give her a call and just have we a have, discussion. Um, we have somebody coming out next month. Um, right, we've got the woman who, uh, Victoria Laracy, who's heading up the workforce housing group, asked you to, mm -hmm. if she could come here. Is that... Right, and Victoria. so is, is there something more we can, I mean, she said she was going to talk about 10 minutes, and is there something more we yeah. can ask of her around that to, to help our process here, or what? What's her background? Um, she's the executive director now of the Workforce Housing um, Group for the Valley. I'm not sure of what she'd be able to do that would help us along in this. I think Kara might be more useful in terms of what actually um, has worked in other towns with steep slopes and mm -hmm. difficult um, develop, you know, land that doesn't readily develop. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've had some uh, proposals for things that simply didn't work because the slope would be too steep or, you know, one thing or another just totally prevent somebody getting access. I remember that 171 acres up behind Eagle Mountain House. That's probably never going to be developed. Um, Outshuler or some, some name like that owns the land, but there's basically no access that's reasonable. <coughs> further on up or uh, through Ann Peterson's land. Yeah. Sean's land. Yeah. Yep, Sean Doucette's land is inaccessible because it's an 18... Um, percent grade mm -hmm. and we only allow you know great place for a ski no <laughs> <laughs> so we don't allow yeah. development on an 18 percent grade road um, so maybe Tara has some solutions for things I'm not sure what Victoria is going to add to it I look forward to hearing what she'd say mm -hmm. uh, certainly she's an advocate for that and may be prepared to help us with arguments about why workforce housing is valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't get the sense that she would have the kind of experience that Tara might have. Yeah, I think I, mean, I don't think any of us objects that we need workhouse, work, workforce housing here in town. No, I, I think we're in the choir. If some of the other people in town who don't want to see any further development and aren't aren't aware that the school is threatened, you know, because it has a few kids and or don't care if it is. I was going to say, yeah, I think they'd love to see the school go and yeah. to see right. fewer yeah. kids in town and you know, but we shrink a big but, part of your tax budget. Oh, yeah. well, there's a couple of bucks off my assessment. Mm -hmm. Exactly, mm -hmm. some tax bill. Yeah, there's really not. Alternatively, if we had 75 kids in the grammar school. There'd be more people paying the tax bill, and that would shrink your bill too. Yeah, there you go. Because it's designed for seventy-five kids, and yeah, we have to pay more if it's only thirty-seven. Very, very low assessed value home. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's get, that's a question of getting the people in here. I mean, yeah. you know, with kids. I mean, exactly. that's a big problem. Yep. Because the houses are too expensive, and or they're not available. And it's every town in New Hampshire that's dealing with this problem, really. It's not just in New Hampshire. My daughter has it over where she lives, yeah, too. Vermont, same exact, Maine. Same exact yeah. area that they have over there and we have right here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same thing going on. That's yeah. one of the things. They have a school that's um, kindergarten through 12th grade in the one school, and they have less than 200 kids in the 12th grade, kindergarten through 12th grade. And they've been wanting, the other towns want to eat them up and all the rest of that stuff, and they're trying to maintain a community there, you know, mm -hmm. because you, you lose your kids, you lose your community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, why don't I ask Tara um, if she can come at the next meeting or the one after that? Does that make some sense? All right. But, and have a conversation beforehand as to yep. what sorts of things that she might be able to... Yeah, what we're right, looking Before for. you bring her in, why don't we talk, talk with her yeah, and definitely. bring her ideas to us so that we can, you know, kick them around again. 
You mean have the ideas without her and then get her later? Why, why not bring her in? I mean, if, I mean, if she doesn't think that she you know, has anything to add to the conversation, then yeah. you know, certainly... But she works it, with all the towns in the North yeah. Country, basically, and so we're not the only ones wondering about this. And Franconia, you know, some towns that are also ski towns have encountered much of this. Maybe she's got some ideas that... And she certainly knows what our zoning is because mm -hmm. it was <laughs> something that she thought was strange. Yeah. And, and that's the other side to the record is, is you know, jobs. You know, yeah. and, and especially when we talk about young families, mm -hmm. you know, that's where we need job, better jobs. And, There's a circle. And, yeah. and, you know, that's... Well, it's also the case that there's a lot of, um, uh, what is it, uh, working from home yeah. uh, people who are, you know, will go down to to Boston maybe mm -hmm. once every two weeks to meet with everybody, but the rest yeah. of the time they're they're on the phone or on the, on the internet yeah. doing their work. So mm -hmm. yeah, we definitely that have sort of, of um, and those type of people would like to be up here. You know, yeah. live here. There, there, there is opportunity here. to uh, leverage the virtual environment. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that many houses going up on the market. And, I mean, that's another thing, you know, I mean, the old houses are already here. People don't want to sell them. They want to live here. They want to live here. So there's a question of where you find places to, and who's going to do it, and, I mean, I don't know if that's really our ball game to be doing that. Well, I think, I think, and I think Sarah was saying that there are two different tacks here. One mm -hmm. is what can we as the planning board do, which is really about regulation. And, mm -hmm. But don't you think if yeah. somebody comes before us and says, hey, listen, I want to do this, and we're going to turn them down, if it's, I mean, whatever the rules and regulations are, I mean, I don't see it, we have that many problems with our zoning, to tell you the truth. Well, we're, we're bound to the regulation, and if there's stuff that we can do within the regulations to make it, to, to advance towards this goal, and that's what we're talking about looking at. I think the other is there, I mean, we have what we have, and the question is, is can we move from there? Are there enhancements we can make to achieve some of the objectives? It may, and you, know, you may, and that's why I say, I'm, I work from ignorance and bias. I, I don't know what those things are. Mm -hmm. That, and if I, if I did, if I, you know, you, then you could just, I could do a brain dump and say, here are the 20 things we could do that are different. And, and that, wouldn't that be great? We can move from here to here. And as a group, if we can do that and find what those twenty things are, and we're going to have we're going to have to find resources, people who have a better understanding of it than we do, uh, and or some of it's going to be our own, uh, you know, effort and sweat to do some of the stuff to take a look and say, well, look at what we have there, and how does that compare to such and such a place, and you know, that one is kind of silly, isn't it? Uh, well, we've actually, yeah. the, you were bringing to the board the idea that our, um, the limitations that we had with um, as far as non-conforming and, and height and so on, and so we changed the regulations to allow that. So it's that sort of thing that we're talking about doing, is finding where the limitations are. And the other tax, and, and I, I agree, it may be something that won't happen until it's made to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it may be that, and this is not a planning board thing, I don't think, but it may be that a group forms, binds a property in one mm -hmm. fashion or another, works with habitat or something to, you know, to then make that property available, probably more towards an Ann Peterson type development, mm -hmm. not just a single residence, but right. a, you know, a, a, a cluster of some sort. Mm -hmm. and, and the flip side of that, I think, Dick, you mentioned that if somebody comes at us with something, uh, are we ready for it? Yeah. Whatever that development And that's what Tara can potentially right. help us with. Yeah. What do we need to change yeah. what to can make we it? do? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I know this is way off the, the chart here. Mirror like Lake. <laughs> Mirror Lake, um, I've only been in there once. Um, are they all on like two acre lots? All those houses in there? Because they all seem like they're all around that one circle. Are they all like two acre lots, or was that built something way differently? No, I, no, I was still after. after yeah, they're not on two acre lots. They're closer together than that. They're clustered. Okay, clustered. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I kind of thought the it was. The cluster, the shared driveways. Okay. And well, it would just be a, you have the whole piece will allow X number of houses, uh -huh. and then those houses were built where they are now, which seems to be clustered together. Okay. I don't know how big the piece is and whether it's association land or how it works, but I do know that that had, was built since since uh, the soil's running. Okay, I'm just curious. I've always been curious about how they, you know, because it looks like a cluster thing to me, and I know that Ann's is the same thing up there, mm -hmm. more or well, less. Right. And I, I think they probably cluster just for efficiency. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My dad did the same thing with his land for my for himself and my brothers, mm -hmm. but it's more it's more what you'd call a pud, although I don't think mm -hmm. puds technically exist in Jackson. But <laughs> it, instead of Small instead of you know the the, the buildings constructed being cl physically clustered, it's mm -hmm. you know it's forty acres with you know, where there are five structures can be you know, five single unit residents can be put on it and they can be put really anywhere within that 40 acres. Or we could find somebody, you know, like maybe B. Davis wants to sell pro her property or something. That's not us for us to go and buy it for as a town, but it would be an idea for, or I don't know, but we have to find, but we don't have to find. Um, but, right, that's what I was talking, well, right. yeah. Scott was saying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there is a group that's working on that, that sort of path towards this, but... Mm -hmm. I think, I think I agree with Betsy, having Tara come in and illuminate, if possible, what types of zoning changes might or might not have any impact I mean, mm -hmm. is a good starting point, you know, as far as what the planning board is mm -hmm. you know, going to be involved in. We're not talking about anything in the loop here, you know, right? Not talking about what? Anything in the loop? In the, in the village? In the village loop? Well, it's hard with the village because so much of it is floodplain. If it's if it's empty of buildings, it's probably in the floodplain. Okay. Yeah. It's great nice place for a golf course. course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and there's nothing up by Black Mountain, right? Well, the Davis land, they have a lot of land up there. Mm -hmm. um, I know where the Black Mountain Meadows are. You know, that's, you know... In the yep. circle thing, kind of a thing with all those condominiums that are there, and then the um, high uh, pastures. High pastures is that, um, and there's the uh, west side and the east side, um, but none of it's affordable. <laughs> no, there you go. Okay. Yeah. You got a few million dollars hanging around. Yeah, and make bucks. All right, so we're going to then, for next, it sounds like for next month's meeting, then we're going to have a guest speaker for workforce housing and anything else that comes up. Is there any other discussion we want to schedule? We might get Malcolm Campbell back for BLA. <laughs> That'd be quick work. If you go back. That probably would be very quick. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm going to throw out something. Why don't each one of us sort of play around with pencil and map and so on and think about how you draw lines or maybe we should be thinking individually, what do we want for Jackson as far as what, what to be allowed that may be not allowed now or what sort of restrictions. Just think about where... Where are we headed? What yeah. ideas? What are we trying to promote? Is Young the, people. <laughs> yeah, is, is, is the build out plan a good place to start for that or not? Um, have a look at it. Okay. It's the way it was generated was um, without any real knowledge of what's here and the um, culture of it. It was it's it's sort of machine generated with certain parameters. Um, do you have a copy of it? I or don't know. I, I saw a summary of it. But I don't of the build out? Yeah, the. Um, so I have a copy of the report. But yeah. I um, well, I, I'm pretty sure I can get you one uh, at the end of the meeting. Okay. It is, is it something that's posted on the. Uh, Online? On our website? I think it is. If it is, I can get it there. It's fine. I'm pretty sure it's on that. Okay. That's a good point. That's great. At some point, jump on the website mm -hmm. and see if you can find it. 
Okay. If not, I mean, worst comes to worst, I can make a copy of it. All right, I can come in and get them. I make a motion. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye